Hi everyone, this is Richard. In this video, we are going to go over nested functions and lexical closure. This is where we start to get a little bit overlapping in terms of definitions in my mind. And so some of the examples will have a little bit example of this and a little bit example of that. Hopefully this will be the last video with regard to functions just because I think we've covered functions almost in its entirety after this. If there is a little cleanup, I'll make another video and um, we'll go over that. But I don't think I, I missed anything overtly. Nested function, basically a function within a function. So um, mean, remember, is a function. So I'm going to say, so second, whoops, let's just say caps lock, second function, I'm going to say um, return true. So function, when you call no, no arguments, no parameters, excuse me, you return true. And so you can print second. So fun this function, you don't have to place it outside. You can put it inside of the function in and of itself. And this goes anywhere itself. It can be functions within functions within functions. Just remember, you have to respect lexical scope. So everything here outside cannot see anything on the inside. Anything on the inside can see, can see anything on the outside. So just remember like integer a um, second return, no, a equals 12 return a. Okay, so print second is 12 because it, it can read the value of the function, but if you try to read, say, print a, it's going to be null, right? Actually, no, it won't be because it already went through. How about if we went th this way? Okay, so it'll print a, which is null, okay? It does not read this, cannot see on the inside, but once you return second, it activates it, and then it turns it a into 12, and then it can actually read it from there on, okay? Because it turns this a, this a, right down here, and it changes the value, okay? So just, just remember, um, nested functions, functions within functions. Lex I think that's pretty straightforward. The, the lexical closure is really not very straightforward. What a lexical closure is, here's an example. Um, Seth Ladd, um, he has some tutorials on Dart language. They're not really meant for beginners, so I changed it a little bit, and I want to explain it because it's an excellent example. If we have something like um, in um, this function right inside here, we'll get this function out of the way. Um, this function inside here, what a lexical closure is, it's getting a function and closing it over to act as if it is a variable it itself. So remember, it has to respect the lexical scope. So in this function, let's take a look at what it actually means. Let's say we have a function called add number. We get the parameter original, okay, the, the original number. We send it down and we can see that there is a new function within the function itself. Okay, so that's a nested function as well. But this, we're talking about lexical closure. So we can notice that this function right here is closed over and it's basically isolated from the rest of it. Now, what's this function do? Well, we're returning the value of this one, this function, add value. But what is that? Int new number. So this function has a new parameter and you return the new parameter along with the original parameter right inside of here. But when you return it, where are you returning it? Let's get the formatting correct. I think it's right. There we go. Um, where are we returning it? We cannot return this several lexical ste lexically scoped steps. Okay, You can only return it to right here. So you return this value to right here. You return add value to right here. And therefore, you can actually call that. Okay, so so let's try. So let's just say, for example, um, I'll just say var um, for easy sake. Actually, I'm not sure what the type on this actually is. Uh, 
I haven't looked at too carefully, but um, for, for right now, I, I don't think it's easy um, to figure it out. But let's just go var um, result equals add number, and let's just say the number 12. Okay? And now let's print result, and let's see what it gives us. It gives us an error. Why? Well, if we put 12 inside of here, it's going to say, okay, fine, return add value. What's add value? Wait a minute. You don't have anything inside of here. So what is this telling us? Remember last video, okay? What is this? This is an anonymous function. So it's saying that you have something, a function to do inside of here, an integer, and it turns into dynamic, it's, um, it returns a dynamic value. It's calling this value dynamic. I'm not exactly sure why, but it's calling it dynamic. Um, so you're missing the integer right inside of there so that you can return a dynamic. So it's saying that this function is being missed itself. This function, this anonymous function is being, is referring to this function right inside of here. So how do you resolve that? You have to fill in the parameter, which is according to this lexical closure, a function. Let's say six. Okay, now let's print it. So let's go through it again. Add number, integer 12. It returns this function. It returns add value. So it calls this fun the value of this function. It doesn't actually call the function. It just, it just returns the value of the function. New number, result is six. Okay, variable res equals to this. I send a new value into this right here. It returns new number plus the original number. And when you return the add value, you're returning what's being returned here. So this will return it to here. This will return it to here. And therefore, it is being captured here and here. So I hope that makes sense to you. It is a little bit confusing. And as time goes by and you start understanding a little bit more about the you know, lexical closures, you understand, you get the better concept of lexical scoping even, it'll make a little bit more sense. So as the functions within functions and you return them, you don't return them to out here. So you can't call them. You, re you return them to out here and then you have to return it one more time. Okay, so that's the example of a lexical closure. The value, it's almost like a variable. It's being closed over and isolated from the rest of the code, but it is accessible. The value is accessible since it is returning it to a visible place in the lexical scoping rules. All right, why am I bringing Fibonacci out? Okay, what's a Fibonacci number? This is another example. It's not truly lexical scope. It's more of a nested function, and it's an example of returning values to and respecting the lexical scope. So I wanted to just use this as an example. Okay, What a Fibonacci number is, by definition, starts with 0 and 1, and every subsequent number, every number afterwards, is the sum of the previous two numbers. So 1 plus 0 equals 1. 1 plus 1 equals 2. 2 plus 1 equals 3, 3 plus 2 equals 5. I think you get the point, okay? So this is what we got. How do we calculate it? According to this function, this is the function for returning a um, Fibonacci number. Um, what it does is if you insert a number along this lines, where along in the position, you will get that particular value. So let me go here and say um, var fib. Bun, no, fib equals Fibonacci 5. Print fib. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, how about 4? So it'll be 3. How about 7? It'll be 13. Okay, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven. So that's what it calculates. What is it actually doing? If we look at it, you introduce a number. Let's just say zero. If number, the parameter, is less than zero, less than two, return zero. 
Okay, less than two, return the number. So that would be return zero. Number one, less than two, return number one. What if the number here is two? So I put number two inside here. Gives me number one. What's going on? It is not less than true. That is false. Therefore, it keeps going down. All right. And it returns Fibonacci number, number two, two minus one. So that's one. Two minus two is zero. So it sends it back. It's recursive. Okay. So it's a recursive. It calls itself Fibonacci two, two minus one equals one. It returns the number one because it returns the number, it's less than two, and it returns zero. So Fibonacci two equals one plus zero, which is one. Zero, one, two, in the two's place, it is one. Now, what if you have number three? What's going on there? Okay, this starts getting a little bit confusing. So we send three, the number three down, three is less than two, right? So it keeps going down. Number minus one, three minus two equals two, okay? And three minus two equals one. So it says the Fibonacci number two, two, back inside of here. We go through the loop again. We know that the value is one because we did that already, but let's go through it again. Three minus one is two, sends it two back up inside of here. It's greater than two, so it keeps going. 2 minus 1 equals 1, and then 2 minus 2 is 0. Sends Fibonacci 1 up inside of here, it returns 1. But remember, it returns it only out to here, out to here, basically. It's a conditional, but the returns, here is the brackets, the lexical scope, it returns the value up to here, and it returns this value as well up to here. So in this circumstance, if we have Fibonacci number three, it sends, okay, I think I lost myself right inside here. This is how confusing this is. So it, it, it sent two minus one, it sent two through, and we went through that, and that equals one. And then it sends Fibonacci three minus two is one, and what's one returns one. So what is Fibonacci three? That should be two, because it was one plus one. And that would be two. Zero, one, two, three. A and we keep going down the line, and I'm, I'm going to get lost if we keep going too far, okay? Because if we send Fibonacci four down, it's less than two. Four minus one is three. Four minus two is two. We knew that was value one. But we get three, we send it down here, and it holds the memory of all of these values as it loops back and forth, back and forth. So if you think how hard that actually is on the memory, you put a huge number inside of here. Um, it, it may take a while itself to actually calculate it itself. Um, and, and sometimes it will actually crash it. It could just, there's too much memory because it's going cycling, cycling, and cycling through. Okay, I'm just going to stop it right then and there. But that's the perfect example of Fibonacci calculator in terms of, of how to actually um, use the concept of the lexical scope returning things, nested functions, and again, even though this isn't truly a lexical closure, because this is a conditional, this is not a function, um, so I don't think it, it may meet the definition of it, but again, this is one of those things, like I said, the definitions do merge into each other, but at least you understand the concept here, it's the same concept overall, and, and that's how we can actually calculate Fibonacci numbers, by returning the number beyond the lexical scope in and of itself, okay? So you, here, just remember, you don't want else because you want to return this number and add it on on top of here also. So it's not an if else statement. It's an if this, add this on to the numbers right around here and it keeps going and going and going, all right? So I hope that was clear. Um, there is a project Euler number two, which we're gonna solve, I think next. If it's not next, then it's going to be the next video after that, but it's going to be very soon with regard to the Fibonacci, and we'll go over that one more time as well.
All right, so thank you for listening, and I hope I didn't make things even worse. If it doesn't make any sense to you, and if you look at this equation and say, again, there's, there's no way I would have ever figured that out, great, because I would never have figured that out either. Th that's what we have other smarter than people than me out there um, who can actually figure it out for me. So I, I just kind of take their work and go with it, okay? And that's that's perfectly fine, and I know that they're, they're okay with that as well. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it.